So this here is my little red eye tree frog, if it will focus on it properly. There he is. Spends most of the day looking like that. Actually, mm, I'm going to go with all of that. Spends the entirety of the day looking exactly like this. They sleep during the day, they're very active at night. Let's see if I can't just nudge him awake. There he is. You see he's got those absolutely gorgeous red eyes, as the name suggests, and these beautiful little blue flanks as well, and that's how you know they're going to jump. They kind of lock on with their eyes, and then they, they kind of tilt. But yeah. Now I'm wearing gloves because their skin is very sensitive. Generally speaking, it's not a good idea to handle these guys at all, to be honest with you. They don't enjoy it, it's not great fun, um, and you can cause them some harm, but the occasional handling just to make sure that they're doing alright is fine. Isn't he pretty? As I said, I can't in all honesty recommend red eye tree frogs to beginners, although they are stunning, and perhaps one of my favourite animals ever, their requirements can be quite specific, and they are extremely shy. I tend to catch... <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> oh no. Right, come here, buddy. I know you're not part of the light. Aren't you gorgeous, though? Let's go pop you back in. Hi, I'm Sam, and this is How Do Things Good. Today, we're talking about tree frogs. What I'm actually here to talk about today is how to provide a good home for a tree frog inside of your home, specifically how best to furnish their homes so that they feel comfortable. I'm going to show you how I planted a new white tree frog terrarium that I built recently, and what I've done to make it as easy as possible to maintain for its new owner, which isn't me for a change. Uh, we're also going to go into the different kinds of tree frog that are available to you and why you can't quite slip a one-size-fits-all approach onto their care. Now let's get started. Now I, like most millennials, spend an inordinate amount of time milling around on sites like Instagram. There's a big exotic pet community based around the platform with hundreds of people, uh, or more, probably more to be honest with you, sharing their pictures of their froggy friends living their best life. Um, but the one thing that I see fairly often, which I must admit bothers me uh, a lot more than it probably should, uh, are these plasticky, fake plant-filled, wet kitchen towel-lined glass or plastic vivariums, uh, in which the frogs they look just a bit like strange wind-up toys, really, rather than the glorious little animals that they are. Now, I know this kind of enclosure appeals to a lot of people because they're relatively simple to set up, and plastic plants are very easy to get hold of and, and to clean. Um, now, I've even heard up the argument before now that they're easier to clean, but that's kind of one of the many myths that I'd kind of like to dispel today. I also have a fairly substantial collection of exotic animals and plants in my care, and it's a pretty much a daily routine for me to check on them, make sure they're thriving, and to tweak their environments if they aren't. One of the biggest breakthroughs for me personally when it came to exotic pet keeping was the discovery of the bioactive terrarium. Um, it's self-cleaning, it's all natural, it's a vibrant space where hiding places can kind of even grow organically into it. You, like They will just develop over time because of the plant matter that you'll use inside of them. The animals will just feel far more at home and honestly they are actually a lot easier to maintain than these sort of plasticky rubbish things. Now, I kind of stumbled upon, upon this um, wizardry through the channel Serpa Design, uh, who I really 100% recommend you go and have a browse through if this is a hobby that interests you. Some of his, um, some of his terrariums are absolutely beautiful. One of the key mechanical principles is the addition of a drainage layer made of non-decomposing gravel or clay pebbles. Now, this prevents the substrate at the bottom from directly sitting in water. 
uh, when you spray it down because obviously in a glass terrarium all of that water is going to trickle down to the bottom and it's just going to kind of sit there. Um, now if you stop the substrate from sitting in it, it stops the organic material inside the substrate from going sour, going a little bit mouldier than you perhaps want it to do so long term. Uh, it also makes it really easy to maintain uh, humidity inside the enclosure because what happens, especially if you use clay pebbles, is that the water gets wicked up. Just the right amount of water gets wicked up to the substrate layer at the bottom and then released uh, into the tank. It makes it so much easier. Now for many tree frogs and amphibians in general, humidity is a huge factor in their well-being. Uh, white tree frogs are perhaps a little bit more forgiving in this respect, but they will still greatly appreciate a higher level of humidity uh, than you provide for a lot of other commonly kept reptiles like leopard geckos or bearded dragons, which are usually from quite arid uh, areas. Now, humidity can be maintained in a few different ways, but the one that is going to have the largest effect uh, is regularly spraying the enclosure with water, which you should always treat with a dechlorinator. That's pretty commonly found in aquatic shops. Anyone who's ever owned an aquarium will know. Uh, you just add a little tablet full of that into the bucket and away you go, really. Now, humidity can also be maintained through planting appropriate plants. Now, have a look at this picture of the rainforest, which should appear round about now, uh, with these enormous clouds of water vapour rising up into the air. Now, that vapour is being pulled up by the plants from their roots and released from the pores, tiny little holes in the leaves in a process called transpiration. Uh, now, plants in the enclosure, they will have exactly the same effect. They will pull water up from the substrate and distribute it through the enclosure, which has an added effect of creating pockets of higher humidity actually underneath and behind the leaves, very similarly to how it works in a rainforest. Now, if the plant has many smaller leaves, it will likely release a larger amount of water vapour due to the far greater surface area. A plant with larger leaves um, will release less water but will also create better sheltered pockets of humidity for which the animals can hide in. Now, for tree frogs in particular, the best combination is to go for a bit of both. Ficus pumila, um, which is a standard for terrariums anywhere, really, is a very popular small-leafed um, vining plant, and it will quickly scramble up and just completely cover a terrarium background if given half the chance. Now, larger vines like Epipremnums and... <laughs> Epipremnums, you try saying that after a few, and phylodendrons will also do very well in a terrarium, uh, providing that you do prune them regularly. Now, they make great places for frogs to sleep and to clamber around. They're big, sturdy plants, but they can get out of control quite quickly. Keep a pair of scissors on hand. Now, for setups with a dedicated water area, like which you might use for re reed frogs, uh, or as I've actually used for my red-eyed tree frog, uh, waterfall and enclosure, uh, I have found that aquatic plants like Anubias are really invaluable as well. Uh, they're hardy, they're strong, they don't mind the frogs walking all over them, and they're very happy to extend their leaves uh, way above the waterline. Actually, you can plant them completely above the waterline as long as that area does have a constant stream of water coming through it. Now, make sure that your plants are pet safe before adding them in, though. Now, certain plants will exude poisonous saps or might be covered in spines, which the frogs will have a hard time avoiding while leaping. Always wash any plants or moss you add to your terrarium as well to make sure that there aren't any residual pesticides sitting on the leaves or anywhere inside of it. Frog skin, amphibian skin in general, is really exceptionally sensitive to any kinds of salts, pathogens or... Uh, harmful chemicals. Lighting will also be key if you have plants in the enclosure. Now, luckily, there's the choice of inexpensive LED lighting available to you is pretty vast. Colour temperature um, should be between daylight white and cool white for the best results. UVB light is a controversial topic, which I encourage you to go and do your own research about. Don't just listen to me go and read something, you know. Um, tree frogs are generally nocturnal and aren't generally exposed to the UV rays from the sun, which many animals use for creating vitamin D, including ourselves. Now, too high of an exposure to UV may also be harmful, as their skin is very sensitive and they aren't in the habit of putting on sunscreen before going outside. However, it has been pointed out that often tree frogs will sleep on the top of leaves in their environment, which may go some way to helping them synthesize vitamin D from their food, because even though they're all asleep, they are still in the path of the sun. Now, 
I haven't found UV to be necessary with any of my nocturnal or forest floor animals. Um, I, I do give them a vitamin D supplement with their food. Uh, most multivitamin and calcium powders from the pet shops will contain it. Uh, just check on the ingredients on the back. So you can just dust the live foods before you add them to the enclosure, and that should suffice. I did mention that frogs eat live foods, right? Really key. They won't eat anything dead. It has to be wriggling. It has to be moving. Otherwise, they just, they just don't care, really. Now, you can also purchase compact fluorescent light bulbs for the purpose of providing UVB light or UV light, but try and go for the ones marked tropical as they tend to have a lower intensity than the ones marked desert. Heat is also important. Uh, most tree frogs you will see for sale, barring the odd European species, are generally from tropical or subtropical climates. Now, you can use heat bulbs to warm up the air in an enclosure, but for me, the best solution has been to use a heat mat attached to the back of the tank. Now, this creates an excellent heat gradient so the frogs can thermoregulate themselves effectively. Although I would advise getting a thermostat as well to prevent the frogs from overheating on particularly warm days. Finally, and I can't emphasize this point enough, make your enclosure beautiful. A good selection of plants attractively arrayed around some hardscaped logs and stones with little bits of moss peeking out will really elevate your enclosure from just a place where your frogs live to an artwork unto itself. Now, you've got to give all the plants a, few, uh, a bit of a trim every few weeks or so uh, just to keep them in a thriving kind of state. Uh, and it will also help you keep track of where your frogs like to hide and where you might need to make changes to your maintenance routines. Uh, beautiful enclosures will draw your attention far more often than bits of rock with paper towels and plastic plants. The more attention, the better. It's kind of a psychological thing. Now, just one small thing as well. With plants, if you've got them inside the enclosure and you're going in and giving them a trim, what you should also have inside the enclosure are two little things. They are springtails and woodlice of some variation. The combination of these two things is invaluable because they will basically, uh, they clean the enclosure for you, seriously. They go around, they eat the frog's poop, they eat the leaves that have fallen off the plants. If you leave the, the leaves on the bottom of the enclosure, they will actually hide under them, they'll sort of gnaw on them, uh, they'll break them down into a nutritious substrate that the plants can then grow from. It's a really good little system. I really recommend having a look into getting some springtails and wood lice. They're usually pretty widely available. Often I get them through eBay of all places. If you're invested in the tank on an aesthetic level, you will start to see it as a system with different parts, and you'll find it much more enjoyable in the long run to keep it nice for your sake, and for that of the tree frogs inside. I should mention tree frogs are nocturnal. I have mentioned this before. As a result, most of the time, that tank will literally just be sitting there with a light on with nothing crawling around in it. And during the day, if it's just kitchen roll and bits of rock, that's an eyesore. If you've got some lovely plants in there, maybe something that's flowering, beautiful. Now, we're gonna have a look at how I set up an enclosure for a pair of white tree frogs. The background in this video has already been made. I, I will do a separate video on making terrarium backgrounds at some point, so don't, don't worry too much about that. Um, and we will start with uh, preparing the enclosure for planting. Small admission, um, when I was doing the filming for actually planting the plants into this enclosure, the, the camera was, the camera work was not good on my part, so a lot of the footage was just off the floor. So I, I do apologise for that, and at some point I will show you properly how to uh, the actual techniques for planting an enclosure. But what I kind of want to give you an idea of is the stages that you need to go through for preparing a tree frog enclosure for the addition of the frogs. And we're also going to add the frogs today. So actually setting up one of these tanks is relatively simple uh, once you've got all the main bits in there. So that's hydraulica I'm throwing in there and some fibre screen mesh which you just place over the hydraulica. It stops the substrate from falling into the water that will be at the bottom of the tank. I add the substrate onto the top of that and then I wash the plants and I plant the plants into it really. Uh, I've even stuck a plant in the background using a little bit of keto which is like a, a peaty muddy bonsai thing. Uh, it's really good for sticking plants to background especially in humid environments like this. 
This particular terrarium, I've also already installed a heat mat onto the back of it. There's a thermostat. There's also a fogger, which is linked up to a humidistat. So it always maintains, I think I've got it set to about 60% humidity. Keep an eye on that, by the way. Especially if you're like me and you buy the slightly cheaper humidistats, you will want to have a secondary measuring device in there just to make sure that it is actually keeping it to that humidity. So moss is obviously a really good feature on the bottom of it. It just kind of like brings everything together and makes it look a little bit more like a forest floor. I've thrown in some springtails there and uh, here are some wood lice that I'm going to be adding in as well. These are Armadillidium clugii. They're really helpful just for breaking down any of the leaf matter, any of the, uh, the froggy waste. Um, and them and the springtails just make a wonderful cleaning solution. It means you never have to clean the cage pretty much. They also help to keep down mould outbreaks, which is extremely helpful. Now obviously they need a bit of food when you get started, so throwing in a few dried leaves or seed pods uh, is a great idea. I've bought some slightly tropical leaves here, they're sort of black pepper leaves and uh, guava leaves, but honestly, go and find some oak and beech leaves, give them, give them a good boil uh, before you put them in if you've collected them from outside, and they will do just fine. So just a word on the lighting in here, the lighting that I've used is an Exoterra uh, canopy light. They fit any sort of uh, terrarium like this, I haven't used an Exoterra terrarium here. This is one from Swell Reptiles, which is kind of a build-it-yourself one, a flat-packed one. But anyway, uh, the lighting is uh, one UVB bulb and one LED bulb, usually I wouldn't use UVB, but on the background I have included some glow-in-the-dark stones, and UVB really helps to uh, charge them up during the day, giving a wonderful blue glow at light. Here's the frogs, two white tree frogs. You notice that the one on the right looks a little thin. Now, I can assure you that a few weeks later, um, he was eating just as well as the other one was, and they are both looking incredibly chubby at this point. And just to give a bit of a close-up of the terrarium here as well, I have actually put a water bowl down on the bottom. Water bowl's really kind of key for any kind of frog, really. Just make sure that it's not too deep, uh, that things like tree frogs do drown in them. Um, so I'm told. I've never had it happen personally, but I have been told stories of it happening, so make sure that they've always got a way out. Make sure that water stays clean as well. It's good to have it like I've got it in there, where it's actually in a um, an inset, so it can be removed and cleaned quite easily. There goes the first one, and the second one just needed a little bit of encouragement with the back of my finger. Now, of course, you should try not to handle your frogs at all, really. Um, their skin's very sensitive. Um, if you do have to handle them, like for moving them from place to place or anything like that, or inspecting them, then do use gloves and give even then give the gloves a bit of a rinse under some water first. But yeah, you see, this is just after they've been released into the tank, and they they go and find a place to hide pretty quickly. Don't go disturbing them too much in the first few days. You want them to feel safe, and you want them to be able to find those spots where they think you can't see them. But yeah, that's the full transformation. So here I'm going to show you uh, how I kitted out my red-eyed tree frog terrarium. Uh, now in this shot, it's a little bit overgrown. Uh, we are going to have a little bit of a trim back of this, and I'm going to show you how it turned out after that point but just to give you an idea this is some oko dragon stone that i built up at the back there's the tree frog there um, and i've actually fed a pipe up through that to create a waterfall which leads down to a uh, plunge pool at the bottom which has a filter in it which then pumps the water back up and it drips down which then gives all of the plants all of the water they need it keeps the humidity nice and high as well as you can see i've got a wide number of plants and mosses growing really happily in there there's some anubias there's some phytonia uh, they always do really well in setups like this there's some Devalia fern ficus pumula tradescantia epipremnum all sorts in there really just a really lovely mixture of colors and 
textures. Now, here's what it looks like after I've given it a bit of a trim back. See, it's a lot nicer, then there's a lot more space, and of course, the more that you stay on top of trimming this tank back, I let this one get away with me a little bit, but the more you stay on top of trimming this tank back, the denser that foliage is going to grow and the nicer it's going to look and the more spots your little frog is going to have to hide in. They prefer the big leaves to hide on. Uh, as you can see, I've got lots of little leaves in there as well, just to sort of maintain that uh, lovely texture and jungly look to the whole enclosure. Tree frogs are beautiful creatures who have a great deal of character and they deserve homes which are tailored to their individual needs. Keeping these animals in your home is a major responsibility, as is keeping any living creature. You should also source your tree frogs responsibly. Avoid purchasing frogs which have been wild caught, or as it's often notated on the websites WC, as they may come with the added risk of parasites and infections from the wild, plus the capture of these animals can be a significant drain on wild populations. Private captive breeding programs for these animals for the exotic pet trade mean that there will always be a reserve population in the event that things in the wild go south, as is already starting to happen with mass deforestation becoming an increasing problem um, across the planet. It also reduces the price that animal collectors can get for them as they become more widely available. Uh, ensuring their wild stocks aren't overexploited to the point of collapse. Organisations like Josh's Frogs in the USA have huge captive breeding programmes for many different species of frogs, uh, and they also send some of their profits to help out conservation initiatives in countries like Madagascar, Panama, Uganda and Costa Rica. When searching for your frog, ensure that the company you are purchasing from is reputable. Where possible, go and see the animals in the location first, or request pictures and video of how they're being kept. Now, most reputable breeders and hobbyists tend to be quite keen on showing off their collections. If they refuse, something might be off. That's a red flag, and you might be uh, shoving your money into the hands of someone who is perpetrating effectively a form of animal abuse. Now, make sure that you know what you're getting into. Do your research on your chosen frog to make sure that you are getting all of their parameters correct in terms of temperature, humidity, heat, and nutrition. A great starter tree frog for anyone is the white tree frog. Uh, they have been bred successfully for years, so very few, if any, to be honest with you, are ever caught in the wild for export. They are large with huge appetites and they can tolerate much lower humidities than most other tree frogs. They are also extremely personable and can become bold enough to take food directly from the fingers of their owners. Tiny tree frogs like African reed frogs are also a good choice and can take up a lot of space due to their smaller uh, enclosure requirements, but it is difficult to source captive bred reed frogs, at least it is here in the UK. They are also very small. If a white tree frog launches itself out of the enclosure, it's pretty easy to track them down. A reed frog might take a lot more searching. I can't in all honesty recommend red-eyed tree frogs to beginners. Although they are stunning, perhaps one of my absolute favourite animals ever, their requirements can be quite specific and they are extremely shy. I tend to catch glimpses of mine as she wanders around the enclosure at night, but if she suspects that she's being watched, uh, she hunkers down onto a leaf and goes into camouflage mode. Personally, I think she's great but you should probably aim for something a bit more manageable for your first tree frog. Whatever you decide to do, and whichever species you decide is best for you, just remember that the animal's needs should always come first. Make sure they're happy, keep an eye on their activities, and keep up with their housekeeping, and they'll give you joy for many years to come. Thanks for watching this episode of How Do Things Good. Uh, this is hopefully going to be part of a bit of a longer series that I'm planning on doing around uh, building terrariums in general, around building bioactive terrariums and about keeping, about exotic pets keeping. I'm still doing all of the technology stuff as well. If you haven't seen the video about the uh, recapping the Super Nintendo and you're interested, go and check that out as well. Uh, but otherwise, like, comment, subscribe if you want to see more. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in future. Cheers. Hello, Rolly boys. Do 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 Rolly boys.
Do 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 Roly boys do 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 Roly boys do 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 That little song will not be making the final cut